Well, good morning, church. Thank you. You may be seated. This Sunday is going to be a little bit of a unique experience. Uh, For those of you, this is the first time in our church. Not every service is done this way. Um, But we thought it most appropriate to welcome in the Christmas season. Doesn't everything look so beautiful today? Didn't, Didn't Paula do a great job? This is an awesome, awesome job. Just usher in Christmas. Man, if you're like me, you want to come to a busy weekend and find some rest today. And that's what we have designed for you. First and foremost, starting with our opportunity to continue our worship today through generosity. Look, the Bible as a Christian both commands and challenges us to give our tithes and offerings. So this is your time, whether it's safely giving online, whether it's texting in, scanning the QR code, or taking that offering envelope and placing it in the baskets as you've entered or as you go. This is your time specifically to continue your generosity to the church, but ultimately to Christ through your giving. So I'm going to pray over the offering that God God blesses both the gift and the giver. Let's go to him in prayer. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Lord, as we set aside this time to worship you through our giving, to continue worshiping through generosity, Lord, bless both the gift and the giver. Lord, allow us to follow your challenge and command that you set before us both in the books of Micah and then all throughout the Gospels confirmed by your son, Jesus. Allow us to follow and take this great command and challenge and truly allow it to imprint on our heart so that we may impact others. We love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in your son, Jesus' name we pray always. Amen. Now, if you notice on the sides, there are still a few, just a few Operation Christmas Child um, tags left. Church, why don't we clear those out, all right? Let's, let's get those all done today. There's only a few left. Clear those out. The top portion is yours. The bottom portion is placed in the baskets as you leave. And uh, another quick reminder is next week starts a brand new sermon series called Christmas Cheer. It's a three-week sermon series. We're going to be talking about how to spread our cheer during this season. It's going to be great. But we thought it would only be most appropriate that during this issuing in of the Christmas season that we observe the Lord's table and allow the Holy Spirit to do an internal work. Look, the goal of today or this morning is incredibly intentional in pausing to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. In a moment, I'm going to read scripture and then we'll continue to worship in song as we come forward to receive the bread or his body. Once we've received the bread, we'll walk through the scripture and partake of his body, the bread. We'll then worship again through song and then follow the same pattern for receiving the blood or the cup. Our heart's desire this morning is that it would be an intentional opportunity for each disciple of Jesus to do the work of confession and repentance that have made, maybe created a distance between us and our Savior. And then finally to rest in the finished work of Jesus. Communion's a reflective space uh, for our hearts to truly embrace all that Christ has done and to have fellowship with him. So as we dive in this morning, why don't we all stand as we read the word of God together. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32 reads this way. For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are ill and some have died. 
But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. You may be seated. This morning is just that. It's an opportunity to examine ourselves. This morning is an opportunity as we are in communion service to ask, am I in communion with God? The psalmist puts it this way, search me, O God, and know my heart, know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the everlasting. James confirms in the New Testament what the Old Testament teaches by saying this, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James instructs us on how to draw near to God. He tells us to purify our hearts. My question to you today is, will you open every closet to Jesus? Disallow any hidden part by practice, by practicing the scriptural call of repentance, confession, and forsaking whatever might cause distance between you and your Savior. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. My prayer this morning is that as a church, as a family, we would follow the practice of communion by walking the path of repentance. After I finish praying for the element of bread, you'll stand and make your way up as Chad sings a song song called Overcome. After this time of worship, keep the bread in your hand. We'll talk on just the bread, and then we'll partake together. Let's pray and then come and receive the element. Father, you are good, and we thank you for your goodness. Lord, as we think about the bread and we dive deeper on what all of that it means, I do pray today that we'll take a moment to reflect on any distance that's between us and you. Lord, and that today truly will be a moment of contemplation and reflection as we dive deeper into our relationships with you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Oh 
Continue to worship this morning. Continue to sing to our Savior, Jesus Messiah, the name that is above every name. Let's declare it together this morning. It's a love 
You know, church, when I think of communion, um, I, I can't help but think of my son. You guys know I'm a young dad, and so oftentimes all of my illustrations are going to be family-focused. You're just going to have to get used to it for the next 30 years or so. But Liam, the first time that he heard the gospel, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he was two years old, and it was described to him in Sunday school as asking Jesus in your heart. And I'll never forget, later on that week, we were talking to him about sharing and all those things. I said, you know, Liam, now that Jesus is in your heart, you know, he would want you to share that object. And he looked at me dead face as he could and said, well, then, Dad, I want my heart back. <laughs> Look. Look, maybe, maybe you're not like Liam, um, and you don't want all of your heart back. Uh, but maybe if you're honest with yourself, Jesus has about 95% of it and not all of it. Like maybe you're like me and you want a little bit of your heart back. <laughs> Is it possible that sometimes we keep the Savior at arm's length because we're disappointed or even maybe disgusted in our own shortcomings, like our own pride? Jealousy, addiction, our own little secret, our own shame, our hurt. As we remember this morning his body being broken for us, will you make it personal? Jesus died for my sins, your sins, individually. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. You know, Jesus didn't die so that we, I could feel the pain of regret. He died so that I might live. Jesus died for my peace. Jesus died so that I don't have to waste my life regretting my own bad decisions. I can repent of those, rely on the broken body, and draw close to him in fellowship again. It's the famous verses of old in John 3, 16 and 17 that said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have life everlasting. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be 
saved. Saved. Sometimes when you come into a communion service, do you feel more condemnation than conviction? Are you condemning yourself? Are you allowing the enemy to return you to condemnation? You see, condemnation is by the enemy and by our flesh to bring guilt and shame. But the Bible says that after we receive Christ, there's therefore now no condemnation to who those who are in him. You see, condemnation says that, that you must listen to the law so that you can receive love. But conviction after salvation is so much different. Conviction is by the Holy Spirit to restore you to Christ. Conviction says this. You're loved, so now go fulfill the law. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference of feeling the weight of condemnation rather than the freedom of conviction. So I ask you, will you come to the table this morning? Will you be reunited, restored, and reminiscent of your relationship with Christ? I often find that a great question to ask is this, especially in time of communion. Has there been a time to where I've been closer to Jesus in my life than right now? If, if there is, then this is what today is for. It's to regain that closeness with Christ. Or maybe in some of your scenarios to start it. Look, we must return to the presence of the one who knows me fully but loves me perfectly. That's what days like today are for. So this morning, we'll partake of the bread. And as we do, uh, I invite you to remember the broken body of Jesus with this in mind. Because of the cross, the forgiveness of Jesus is now eternally accessible to you. He loves you and he cares for you and he wants to welcome you home. Allow the gospel to touch every piece of your heart. Don't take any back. We take the bread this way traditionally in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 24. The Bible says this, for I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took the bread and broke it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do ye in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him this morning. At this time, church, I encourage you to stand. Abby's gonna come up in a moment. She's gonna sing an incredible song called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. That'll be your opportunity to come and take the blood, take the cup. Then I'll return and speak on the cup, and we'll re enter a time of worship together. Abby, we come.
chains freed my soul and for the first time I had hope Thank you Jesus for the blood applied Thank you Jesus it has washed me white Thank you Jesus you have saved sing this old hymn of the faith, what can wash away my sin? Let's sing this together. And what can wash away my sin? Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Oh, nothing but
You know, every time the cup of communion is mentioned, it's specifically mentioned that this is the cup of the new covenant. The new covenant. Have you ever thought what that means? Like, what are the old covenants? If there's a new one, there's got to be some old ones, right? Behind me, you'll list, you'll see a list of covenants that Jesus has fulfilled. Maybe some of them you're familiar with. The Noahic covenant is this, that this is where God destroys the world through the flood due to its wickedness. An appropriate picture of God's view of wickedness and sin. However, you guys know at the end of this story, God rests a beautiful bow in the clouds and vows never to destroy the earth by flood again. The bow is now pointed towards heaven. Beautifully pictured. The Abrahamic covenant. God enters a redemptive partnership with Abraham and promises him the land of Canaan, or um, rather, I'm sorry, uh, promises him the progressive development of his family through Genesis 12, 15, 17. He promises Abraham will inherit this piece of land called Canaan and We studied that a little bit in Joshua. The Mosaic Covenant that continues this, God rescues Israel and sets them up, sets himself up as the the Redeemer. God rescues this beautiful nation from slavery in Egypt, sets them apart as a holy nation, and personally dwells in their midst, brings them into the promised land. God, Yahweh, and them, Israel, will be his people. Moreover, there'll be a kingdom of priests that meditate his goodness and glory to all the nations, a beautiful role in redemptive history. The Davidic covenant, God establishes David to reign over this Israelite kingdom and promises to make his name great. He'll give David a royal kingdom in which he promises, uh, in which the promises made to Abraham and Israel will be fulfilled through his lineage, God will raise up a Davidic descendant who will build a house for the Lord and his throne and kingdom will last forever. God's steadfast love endures forever and it'll never depart from him. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these covenants. He's the great covenant keeper. He satisfies all of the covenants and then starts a new covenant called the gospel. 
This gospel of grace comes by the perfect living of Jesus, sacrificed perfectly on the cross and rising beautifully three days later so that we may enter the covenant of grace. You see, Jesus fulfills all of these covenants and then finishes with presenting us the beautiful covenant of grace. His work is finished and it's totally completed. You see, we need no earthly high priest anymore. Jesus is our high priest as he claims in Hebrews, I'm now seated at the right hand of the Father. You see, there was never any furniture inside of the temple dwelling of the high priest. And you want to know why? Because the work of the temple was never done. But when Jesus, the ultimate high priest, comes down and finishes the work on the cross, he then ascends to heaven and sits, saying, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. But you see, it can't be done without the blood. It can't be done without the body broken. It can't be done without the blood poured. But when we partake in this ordinance, church, we're partaking in an ordinance that's finished and completed, fully whole and fully satisfied. This is a reflective ordinance. It's the new covenant, and it's called the gospel. Maybe we're not living in the promise of this new covenant because we can't believe that we could achieve the holiness to receive this covenant of grace. Like maybe, maybe you sit there like many of my friends before and and me at points in my life and say, I could never achieve the holiness that's required in partaking of this new covenant called the gospel. And my friend, an old Baptist pastor said it this way. I love his quote. He said, holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. You see, the gospel isn't about us sitting here, cleaning ourselves up, getting us all ready, and then coming in and say, Jesus, do you accept this? The gospel is about us presenting ourselves and saying, I don't have anything, but but Jesus did everything. And so I'm, can I use his? Can, Can I use his? And that's what we present to the father. And he looks down. And when he looks down, he doesn't see you any longer. He sees Jesus. This is the new covenant, broken in my body, paid for with my blood. This is the ordinance in which we partake. Holiness isn't the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. We have fellowship with Jesus because of his finished work on the cross. When I examine myself, I must examine myself, therefore, through the lens of the gospel. There's another old pastor that says it this way, and one of my favorite modern teachers um, at our old church gave me this illustration, and he said, the pastor was describing what he did to get saved, and the old pastor looked at him and said, well, I did the sinning, Jesus did the saving. I love that. This morning, we'll drink from this cup, and as we do, I invite you to celebrate the new covenant of Jesus because his shed Blood of Christ is now, makes Christ eternally accessible to you. He loves you. He cares for you. He desires to be in fellowship with you. Will you allow him to be? You know, for the Christian, I don't want you to look at the gospel as the diving board into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is where we swim, it's where we start, and it's where we finish. It's where we live. We live inside of the gospel. It's not the starting point to Christianity, it is Christianity. And we partake of the body and the blood, we're saying I'm in union with this body of Christ. I'm in harmony. But for some of you, for some of you, you've never joined that harmony. You, sure, you may have been religious before, but you, you never realized it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So the bread and the, the cup today are, are just symbols, religious symbols to you. And, and I'm here to tell you, my friend, I don't want them to be that way for you the rest of your life. I want you to be able to take ownership of your relationship with Christ today. 
And at Gloucester County Community Church, we've been saying this for years, access to Christ is as easy as ABC. You see this Jesus we've been celebrating, the, the broken body, the blood, he died for you. He lived for you, then died for you, and then rose again, proving he was who he says he was, God on earth, Emmanuel, God with us. And he wants you to be part of his family. Don't ask me why. I don't know why he wanted me. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that he wants you just because he wants you. It's a beautiful truth. So my friend, I, I pray that today is your day of salvation. And here's what you have to do. You have to acknowledge or admit that you're not perfect. That one should be easy, right? Like none of us are perfect in the room. The Bible calls those imperfections sin. Second, you have to believe in all that's kind of taken place today. That Jesus broke his body for you on the cross, shed his blood for the remission of those imperfections called sin, and rose again three days later. And then see, commit to him today through prayer. In a moment, I'll lead you in what we call a sinner's prayer. The prayer is nothing but words. It's the belief and commitment through that prayer that saves you. And I'd encourage you to do it today. Look, today can be your day of salvation. Don't, don't wait. Do it now. Why not live in the peace and harmony and gain immediate access to Christ like so many other in this room have? Let's pray together. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later. I'm calling on you to be my savior. Help me to live for you. I love you. Amen. For those of you who made that decision with me, I, I want to know. You see, when new Christians start their journey, we don't believe in just saying congratulations and welcome and then leaving you on your own. We want to walk beside you. So behind me are a few ways to let me know for those of you who made today your day of salvation. Fill out the connection card, place it in the offering on the way out. You can also email me or text me if you feel more comfortable. And please, if you've done this today, or for those of you who have done it, because I know there are a few, please stop at the Next Steps banner. We'll get you a Bible, it has a little letter inside, and we'll walk next to you as you start your new journey. Now look, for those of us who have been on this journey for a while, if the bread, his body, is a call to forgiveness, then the blood, his cup, is a call to fellowship. Th this morning, will you remember that Jesus shed his blood so that you can have access to him, not because you're good, but because he's good. Let's have fellowship with the Father through the shed blood of the Son. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 26 reads this way. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes in remembrance of him. Church, will you stand with me? We're gonna end this service as we usually do through worshiping to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through song. We've sung songs today about the body and the blood, and I want to honor you. This is a unique service. I want to thank you for, for joining in on this experience and making this day special. I hope you found rest today. I hope you reset you the rhythms of your soul today, and I hope you reflected on your restoration in Jesus Christ.